You know, recently I was on the Feminist Frequency Star Trek podcast with Anita Sarkeesian, and whoops. <laughs> there we go. And we were discussing a recent episode of Star Trek Discovery, and Anita said something like, what did you think of this episode, Steve? Oh, wait, it's Star Trek. Of course you liked it. And like, that's so not true. The Star Trek franchise has produced plenty of stuff over the years that I haven't liked. Yeah, it's just that I don't get all worked up about it. There's way too much performative negativity in the media, especially online as it is. I don't want to add to that. Plus, come on, it's Star Trek. I love it, it's important to me, but it's still a TV show. What is there to get bent out of shape about? Why did Enterprise have to spend two episodes explaining the Klingon thing? Worf's line in Trials and Tribulations was perfect. Anything more was a waste of time. Anyway, just because I don't make a big deal about it doesn't mean there aren't things about Star Trek that I don't like. There's that, and there's... <sighs> I'll never make a video titled, Why Loxana Troy is Actually Pretty Awesome, I'll tell you that much. Not even if somebody paid me. Seriously, commission me to make that video. See how fast I refund your money. It ain't happening. Not for 50 bucks, anyway. I guess what I'm saying is my soul is for sale, but if you want it, you'd better get out your checkbook. Metaphorically speaking, I don't take checks. Get out your bank card. Why didn't I just say that? The thing is, this all kind of balances out because the truth is, influential online media figure and person who has repeatedly had me as a guest on her podcast, Anita Sarkeesian. Gosh darn it. <laughs> it's just all thumbs today. She's right that I do like most Star Trek. There are some parts of it that I think are not very good, but then again, there are also bits which most other fans think aren't very good, but which I like very much. I'm going to talk about one of those in this video, as a matter of fact, as I attempt to explain why Dr. Pulaski is actually pretty awesome. Ah, yes, Dr. Catherine Pulaski, the Enterprise D's other chief medical officer. She's portrayed by Diana Moldar, the accomplished character actor who had, among her many credits, two appearances on Star Trek The Original Series, as Anne Mulhall in Return to Tomorrow and Miranda Jones in Is There in Truth No Beauty, and who would go on to play a recurring character with a memorable exit on L.A. Law and to provide the voice of Dr. Leslie Tompkins, on Batman the Animated Series. Pulaski joins the crew of the Enterprise in Season 2, replacing Dr. Beverly Crusher, who, it was explained, had transferred to Starfleet Medical. Cool story, but in real life, Diana Moldar was brought in as Pulaski because the producers of TNG fired Gates McFadden for being too outspoken about how sexist she thought the writing of the show was. Da, 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 da. Pulaski was an unpopular character from the beginning, which was to be expected. The deck was stacked pretty severely against her. Dr. Crusher was one of the fan favorites of TNG's underwhelming first season, so many viewers were unhappy happy to learn of her departure, and not in the mood to welcome her replacement with open arms. Producers of TNG didn't do anything to help the transition along, either. If anything, they exasperated the anti-Pulaski sentiment in the fanbase by making Pulaski into an acerbic and argumentative character, a stark contrast to the comforting and maternal presence of Dr. Crusher. But that was only step one. As if fans weren't already pissed off by the mere fact that Pulaski wasn't Crusher? The producers of TNG also had Dr. Pulaski disrespect the most popular character on the show, Lieutenant Commander Data. She didn't have a chance. The bias against her from fans who wanted Crusher back was probably the main reason Pulaski never got over back in the day, but I actually think Pulaski's treatment of Data is the biggest reason why Trekkies don't like her today, so that's what I'm going to focus on here. And what better place to start than Pulaski's first interactions with Data, which, appropriately enough, take place in Pulaski's first episode, which is also the first episode of TNG's second season, The Child. Yes, it's the episode where Counselor Troy is impregnated without her knowledge or consent by an alien life form who just wants to understand humans. Truly one of the finest and most loved episodes of TNG. 
No, I'm kidding. It's one of the worst shows they ever made. But hey, at least it does a decent job introducing Dr. Pulaski, throwing her right into the middle of some wacky Star Trek shit. Troy's alien pregnancy proceeds at a highly accelerated rate only two days after getting knocked up by Mr. Flair. She's ready to give birth. Data is present in sickbay when Troy goes into labor and volunteers to stay with her to provide support during the delivery. We get our first hint of what the dynamic between Pulaski and Data will be like and why Pulaski treats Data the way she does when the doctor says to Data, Counselor Troy is going to need the comfort of a human touch, not the cold hand of technology. And Troy says, oh, hush, Data's cool. And Pulaski's just like, whatever, guess I'll deliver this weirdo Star Trek baby then. And the scene goes on and that's that. A little bit later in the episode, we start to get a clearer picture of Pulaski and what her deal is with Data. The two of them are in sickbay studying viral specimens that have recently been brought on board. And Pulaski says, hey, Data, come look at this. And he's like, oh, I know you meant to say Data. Pulaski's like, right, that's what I said, Data. Except, no, Data, what's the difference? The difference is Data is my name, and Data, I do not know what that shit is. That sounds like some shit you just made up. And Pulaski's like, whatever, get over yourself, robot. Or do you prefer rowboat? Fucking entitled millennial. I embellished a little, as is my way, but you get the idea. Pulaski mispronounces Data's name, Data corrects her, and instead of going, oh, Sorry, thanks for telling me it won't happen again, like you're supposed to do when you call someone by the wrong name. She kind of gives him a hard time over it. This scene is upsetting to a lot of people, and I don't wonder why. Calling someone by their right name is not that difficult to do, nor is it a privilege someone needs to earn. It's bare minimum, basic respect. Knowingly mispronouncing or calling someone by the wrong name or treating them as though they're being unreasonable for wanting to be called by their right name, and <laughs> their right name is whatever the fuck they say it is, just so we're clear on that, is not okay. It's not okay for us today. It wasn't okay in 1988 when this episode of TNG premiered. It's not okay for fictional characters in the imaginary 24th century. Call people by the name they ask you to call them, and don't be a dick about it. This ain't difficult. To her credit, Pulaski does call Data by his right name from that point forward, but that doesn't mean she suddenly starts respecting him. In the very next episode, where silence has lease, Pulaski comes to the bridge after the Enterprise has gotten lost in a mysterious void from which there seems to be no escape. With the main viewer showing nothing but blue fog, Pulaski gives Data a series of orders to magnify the image. None of the magnifications make any difference. The viewer continues to show the same thing. In frustration, Pulaski turns to Picard and says, It does know how to do these things, doesn't it? And Picard's like, oh, oh, oh shit. Realizing her faux pas, Pulaski turns back to Data and says, I'm sorry, it's just that I'm not used to working with soulless machines who mock humanity by taking its form and- Oh! Did it again! Starfleet says you're alive, and I have to be nice to you, so I guess I will. Anyway, are we cool? I get that Pulaski has an I don't trust technology thing, which is fine, and this is only her second episode, but come on! She calls him IT? In front of the rest of the crew? And then she can't even get through apologizing without insulting him again? Nobody else treats Data like that. Nobody else who lives on the Enterprise treats Data like that. Right about now, some of you are probably thinking, hold on, or as you Brits would say, hang on a tick. Because that's how you talk. I learned that from watching Austin Powers. Anyway, you're probably thinking... I thought this video was supposed to convince us that Dr. Pulaski is awesome, but so far, you've only been talking about why she sucks. What's up with that, Steve? Did you lie to us? Is that what you did? Ha 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 ha! No. What's up is, you suckers have just been taken in by the oldest trick in the book. Storytelling. See, Pulaski started out treating Data with a level of icy contempt normally reserved only for computers running Windows ME, but she didn't end up that way. This is possible thanks to a storytelling technique known as character development. So, this X here represents Pulaski's character in her first episode, and this X represents Pulaski in her last episode. Now, 
follow me here, this gets a little technical, Pulaski moves from this starting point to this ending point as a result of what happens to her during the course of this show. She's the same person here as she is here, but she has changed as a result of her experiences. She has progressed as a character with each appearance in the show represented as a step along the way from here to here, allowing her to cross this distance by traveling what we call the character arc. So if she's a jerk here, but she's no longer a jerk by the time she gets here, we shouldn't hold the fact that she's a jerk here against her, because that was just the starting point of her character arc. She was started out here on purpose, so she could be shown to grow and change throughout her appearances on the show, and eventually get to here, where she's no longer a jerk or at least not so much of a jerk, or at the very least, not a jerk in the exact same way as she was when she started. The procedure by which the creators of the show are able to move her from here to here along her character arc is known as writing. And actually, since this is TNG and character development isn't really its strong suit, especially in the early seasons, they're probably shouldn't be this many milestones on the character arc. It's more like this one where she doesn't like Data, and this one where she has a change of heart and starts to like Data, and then it just kind of continues like that. If she was a character on Deep Space Nine, there'd be like a hundred of these. So, Let's talk about that change of heart Dr. Pulaski has regarding Data. It happens relatively early on in the season, Episode 7 to be exact, which is a show titled Unnatural Selection. The Enterprise receives a distress call from the starship Lantry. When they reach the Lantry, the crew detects no life signs, and when they peek at the bridge through the main view screen, they see no one but a bunch of dead old people. Dr. Pulaski's scan confirms. The crew of the Lantry died of old age. Picard's like, that's unusual because officers that old should have been forcibly retired years ago. We still do that, right? Records indicate that the crew of the Lantry wasn't as old as they looked, and the Lantry's captain's log describes how a mysterious illness afflicted the crew, causing them to age rapidly and die. Pulaski notes that as of their last checkup, the crew was in good health. The medical records indicate the first officer being treated for a case of the Thalusian flu a few days ago, but that's it. Do you see what happens when you don't get your flu shot? Do you see? Look at it! The Lantry's last stop before all of this happened was the Darwin Genetic Research Station, an innocent-sounding facility which I'm sure had nothing to do with this, but on Pulaski's advice, Picard decides they better drop in for a checkup just in case they've been affected too. So they quarantine the Lantry, then warp off to Darwin Station. When they get there, they're greeted by this middle-aged woman, Dr. Kingsley, who reveals that the station's complement has been affected by the same rapid aging disease that killed off the crew of the Lantry. Kingsley even pulls a Hans Molman, telling the alarmed Captain Picard, I'm only 35 years old! Spare a moment of sympathy, if you would, for Patricia Smith, the actor who played Dr. Kingsley, who was only in her late 50s when this episode was produced, but who had to pretend that she was a person in her mid-30s who was rapidly turning to dust, and that's why she looked the way she looked. And yeah, as the episode goes on and the disease progresses, they do age her up with makeup, but in these initial shots, that's just her. And she's got to be like, I'm only 35, look at me! Spare a thought also for the extras who played the crew of the Lantry. What was that casting call like? Wanted, actors who can close their eyes and slump in a chair a bit and look as though they've died of old age. I guess I can't feel too bad for them, though. They got a payday. They got to be in a Star Trek show. It's probably more than most of them ever thought would happen when they dreamed of being actors as kids, which, from the looks of them, I'm guessing was sometime during the McKinley administration. I'd worry that some of them might watch this video, hear that joke, and get their feelings hurt, but, you know. Anyway, Picard wants to quarantine Darwin Station, but Kingsley says, what about our children? It turns out the scientists at the station have created a group of genetically engineered children because nobody ever learns anything. And if the station is quarantined and the afflicted crew members die, 
the children will eventually starve. But Kingsley has a solution. Quarantine the station, but let the children leave, because they've been isolated since the aging disease broke out and have shown no symptoms. Picard's not convinced it's safe, so Pulaski suggests beaming one of the monsters, I mean children, children is what I said, aboard the Enterprise, in suspended animation and encased in styrolite, which, from the looks of it, is the kind of plastic they use to make vacuform molds. Picard's like, okay, I guess. So they beam one of the kids aboard wrapped in plastic. He's supposedly 12, but he looks about 20. Oh, and Troy can sense that he's telepathic. Awesome. Totally not alarming and awesome. Pulaski runs some scans, then she's like, okay, he seems fine, I'm gonna unwrap him. But just to be safe, Pulaski moves the operation onto a shuttlecraft, where they'll be totally isolated from the rest of the Enterprise crew in case something goes wrong. Then, along with Data, who is serving as shuttle pilot, Pulaski frees the mind-reading Super Frankenstein, the child, frees the harmless child from the plastic, and starts running some tests. Pulaski looks like she's about to certify the kid as safe and unleash him on an unsuspecting galaxy when she suddenly feels a shock of pain in her arm. It's a sudden arthritic inflammation, Pulaski says, the first symptom of the aging disease. The children may not be affected by it, but they are carriers. And now Pulaski has been infected, leaving her and Data no choice but to take the shuttlecraft down to Darwin Station. Aboard the Enterprise, Captain Picard, in a moment of characteristic empathy and humanity, tells the rest of his senior staff, fuck all those people on Darwin Station, how do we help Dr. Pulaski? Geordi and Chief O'Brien come up with a plan to use the transporter's biofilter, along with Pulaski's saved transporter pattern, to purge the disease from her system. There's only one problem. Technophobic Pulaski has never used the transporter, which means they don't have her pattern on file. While the gang on the Enterprise figures out what to do next, Pulaski and Data arrive at Darwin Station, and Kingsley shows them the rest of the children, who, it turns out, can not only read minds, but also move objects with their minds. Through telekinesis. What are you doing? What are you people doing? Let's build some kids from scratch using genetic manipulation. We'll make them bigger and stronger than we are, plus powerful psychics. What could possibly go wrong? Why would anyone do this? It's like these people exist at the intersection of advanced scientific expertise, suicidal ideation, and extreme boredom. Oh yeah, and it turns out, in addition to making the kids bigger, stronger, faster, and telekinetic telepaths, the Darwin Station researchers also gave them aggressively proactive immune systems that release antibodies into the environment to attack potential causes of disease. Remember how the crew of the Lantry visited Darwin Station? Remember how the first officer had the flu? A quick genetic analysis by data confirms that when the children's advanced immune system encountered the flu virus, their antibodies attacked it and inadvertently created a mutated antibody that alters human DNA and causes the rapid aging. This is why you don't do this. Something like this always happens. You need to be more careful. You live in Star Trek. Genetic engineering never works out. Genetic engineering almost never works out. Pulaski and the crew at Darwin Station are screwed, but Data is confirmed to not be a carrier of the disease, so he prepares to return to the Enterprise. Before he does, he and Pulaski have a moment together. Data expresses regret that he couldn't do anything more to help. Pulaski assures Data that he did everything he could and says... Commander, you may be a lifeless automaton whose very existence profanes the natural order, but you're all right with me. What she actually says is, as androids go, you're in a class by yourself. And Diana Moldar and Brent Spiner both play the scene in such a way that it's obvious Pulaski and Data have developed a mutual respect, perhaps even a spark of friendship. It's a nice scene. I just had to do my little skit. But all hope is not lost. Data returns to the Enterprise to be greeted by Picard, who has had a brainstorm. If they don't have Pulaski's transporter pattern to use as a guide for the biofilter, maybe they can use a sample of her healthy DNA instead? Data and O'Brien exchange technobabble for a few seconds and come to an agreement that it's just crazy enough to work. So Riker and Data rummage through Pulaski's underwear drawer and find a hair from her brush. 
which she keeps in her underwear drawer. And they grab a DNA sample from the follicle, which they use to modify the transporter and filter out the disease and blah blah blah. Point is, it works. They use the transporter to cure the crew of Darwin Station too, and because the mind-ripping abominations, children, because the children are still carriers of the rapid aging antibody and are also equipped with immune systems capable of creating horrific killer diseases, they will remain in isolation, which means the galaxy is safe. For now. At no point during Pulaski's tenure on the show do we get a scene between her and Data where she expresses an awareness that she mistreated him in their early interactions and apologizes. And that's too bad. It would have been nice to show Pulaski's growth in this aspect of her character a little more explicitly, but I think we can safely conclude that such growth occurred nonetheless. Pulaski and Data's relationship doesn't become a major feature of the second season. The writers spend more time establishing a friendship between Pulaski and Worf, oddly enough, which is fine, but the Pulaski-Data thing is right there. However, there are a few scenes from episodes later on in the season that indicate Pulaski has gotten past her initial antipathy toward Data. The first is in the episode Pen Pals, the one where Data violates the Prime Directive by communicating with a little girl, Sarjenka, whose planet is about to be destroyed due to a natural instability in its crust, and Picard is annoyed because now he has to choose between allowing an entire sentient species to die and breaking a rule. And who wants to be faced with a decision like that? Picard convenes a meeting of the senior staff to discuss what they should do, and Pulaski takes Data's side and argues pretty strongly for intervening to help Sarjenka and her people. When Picard cautions Pulaski against allowing her emotions to influence her position on this matter, Pulaski counters, My emotions are involved. Data's friend is going to die. That means something. Worf, who is on the let him die side of the argument, is like, yeah, it means something to Data. And Pulaski responds, does that invalidate the emotion? Eh? <laughs> she shut your ass up with that one, didn't she, Worf? I like you, man, but you're a cold motherfucker sometimes. Eventually, they decide to prevent the destruction of Sarjenka's planet and to have Dr. Pulaski erase Sarjenka's memories of having spoken to Data to prevent any cultural contamination. As she's about to perform the procedure, Pulaski assures Data that he's doing the right thing, the best thing for Sarjenka. She comforts Data by telling him that even though Sarjenka won't remember him, he will remember her. Then, near the end of the season, there's the episode Peak Performance, where Pulaski wants to teach a lesson to this cocky bastard, Master Strategist Kolrami, so she challenges him to a game of Stratagema, which I'm guessing has something to do with strategy, on Data's behalf, thinking that Data, being a computerized robot man, will absolutely murder this asshole. Instead, despite Pulaski's last-minute encouragement to bust him up, Data loses to Kolrami. Pulaski's like, but your robot brain! How did he defeat your robot brain? Data starts wondering about that himself. His confidence in himself is so shaken, he starts avoiding the bridge. He's worried that the captain won't be able to rely on his advice. One of the people who drops by his quarters to give him a pep talk is Dr. Pulaski. At first, she tries the tough love approach, telling him to cut the bullshit, quit sulking, and get back to work. But when Data tells her that he's genuinely worried about letting the captain down, Pulaski softens and tells him, I wish I had never maneuvered you into playing that game. I'm sorry. Then, at the end of the episode, Data and Kalrami have a rematch, and by playing for a stalemate instead of a victory, Data is able to prolong the match until a frustrated Kalrami quits. While Data is reluctant to declare himself the winner, Pulaski insists, you have beaten him. And Data's like, yeah, I busted him up. And they all do the end of episode laugh, which you don't see much nowadays. I'm not sure why. With some fans complaining about how dark modern Trek is, bringing back the end of episode laugh might not be a bad idea. Could help some of the heavier episodes go down a little easier, like Stardust City Rag the fifth episode of Star Trek Picard's first season. Yeah, there's some wackiness in the middle, with Rios dressing like a pimp, and Picard donning an eye patch and beret and affecting his Pepe Le Pew accent. Good times. 
but it also gets pretty bleak, beginning with torture chased with euthanasia and ending with a murder and all. What if at the end, after Gerardi has, you know, done her murder, the rest of the gang comes running into sickbay led by Picard, and they all stop in their tracks and stare, shocked, unsure what to say or do. Then Picard reaches back for that accent and goes, Sacre bleu! And there's silence for another beat. Then everyone breaks up laughing. Take the edge off a little. Send the people home happy. That's what I say. Anyway, Dr. Pulaski, she starts out mistreating Data, no question about it. The disrespect she shows him initially is inexcusable, but it's a part of her character arc. She starts out being shitty so she can become progressively less shitty as the season goes on. By the end of her one season on the show, she and Data are obviously friends. That being the case, I don't think it's fair to hold her initial shittiness against her. Besides, at least Pulaski's early bigotry toward Data was put to some creative use and actually went somewhere, as opposed to the classic Star Trek crew member who provided much of the inspiration for Pulaski's characterization. Reportedly, Gene Roddenberry based Pulaski on the Doctor from his original Star Trek show, Dr. McCoy. Like McCoy, Pulaski has a mistrust of advancing technology, particularly the transporter, and where McCoy is often inexcusably racist towards Spock, Pulaski is positively pulsing with prejudice toward our positronic pal, Commander Data. At first. See, while it soon becomes apparent that, despite the typically caustic nature of their association, Spock and McCoy are friends, McCoy never really drops the pointy-eared, green-blooded hobgoblin stuff. And we're not supposed to want him to. McCoy's barrage of insults and abuse is played off as good-natured ribbing between friends. Sure, McCoy is constantly spewing racial slurs at Spock in front of the captain, often in front of the entire bridge crew, but it's okay because Spock can handle it and he gives as good as he gets. Nobody should be expected to change. This is fine. Pulaski, on the other hand, not only grows to regard Data as a friend, she soon stops mistreating him on the basis of him being an android. Like I said earlier, we never get an actual apology from Pulaski, which would have been nice, but her behavior toward Data definitely changes. Most importantly, unlike McCoy's bigotry toward Spock, we're supposed to notice that Pulaski's disrespecting of Data is not okay. It's not presented as all in good fun. It's presented as wrong and unacceptable. And when she does it in front of other characters, specifically Counselor Troy and Captain Picard in The Child and Where Silence Has Least, respectively, Pulaski is contradicted and corrected, albeit gently, which is still more pushback than McCoy ever got. And by the way, I'm not saying Dr. McCoy is a bad character or that it's not okay to like Dr. McCoy. Dr. McCoy is my favorite character from Star Trek, the original series, and DeForest Kelly is my favorite actor from that cast. I'm just saying he displays a lot of what we in the real world would call racism towards Spock and never gets checked for it. And that kind of sucks, especially for a show as unapologetically anti-racist as Star Trek typically was. Anyway, again, Dr. Pulaski's early season mistreatment of Data is part of her character development. It's where she starts, not where she ends up. It's something she's meant to grow out of and something she does grow out of. And on top of that, the show uses it to model for the audience that such behavior is wrong, not to be imitated, and not to be tolerated. And given all of that... I don't think Pulaski's disrespect of Data is a good reason for regarding her as a bad character. Of course, the title of the video is Why Dr. Pulaski is Actually Pretty Awesome, not Why Dr. Pulaski is Actually Not That Bad. Personally, I find Pulaski's awesomeness to be self-evident, but I suspect some of you will want specific examples, which is why I found some. Sorry, it seemed like that was building to something more dramatic but then it wasn't. And that is an element of narrative which we call the anticlimax. Star Trek has a proud history of brilliant doctors, and Pulaski fits right in with that lineage. Like the other doctors we've met throughout the various Star Trek series, Pulaski is the ultimate general practitioner. She's proficient in fields as diverse as neurology, wiping Sarjenka's memory and pen pals, and using Riker's own memories to fight off that clip-show-inducing parasite in Shades of Grey, 
ophthalmology, and loud as a whisper, she offers to replace Jordy's visor with ocular implants, an operation she says she's performed successfully twice before. Cardiology, she's apparently the only doctor within traveling distance qualified to perform a procedure necessary to save Captain Picard's life when his cardiac replacement surgery goes tits up in Samaritan Snare. And genetics. She figures out that the residents of the Mariposa colony are a bunch of clones and determines that she and Riker have been cloned because they're missing a few stomach cells. True, she then beams down to the planet with Riker and just kind of stands there while he murders both their clones. Not the most shining moment, especially for a doctor, but hey, nobody's perfect. I never said she was perfect. Besides being a great doctor, she's also a general purpose badass. After she discreetly treats Worf for an embarrassing illness in Up the Long Ladder, he shows his gratitude by bringing her some Klingon tea. He warns her that it's only ceremonial since the tea is poisonous to humans, but Pulaski is like, hold up, grabs a hypo spray, injects herself with an antidote to the poison, and drinks the tea anyway, because that's how she rolls. Oh yeah, and she totally banged Riker's dad and didn't tell Riker about it until his dad came aboard the Enterprise like the fucking boss she is. And you know she must have rocked his world. Come on, Kyle, you play it cool. But you've been missing that, haven't you? Yeah. Kyle Riker knows firsthand what many of us have known all along, that Dr. Pulaski is actually pretty awesome. The only reason for thinking otherwise that I don't really have a rebuttal for is that she isn't Dr. Crusher. Because she's not. And if this was 1988 and we didn't know that Gates McFadden would be back on the show in a year, I could understand that. I love Dr. Crusher, too. But we got her back. Crusher returned to the Enterprise in Season 3, while Pulaski apparently stepped into an empty turbo shaft and was never seen again. So give Dr. Pulaski a break, huh? She brought a fresh personality to the show, added a touch of interpersonal conflict to a crew in desperate need of livening up. Through her changing feelings about Data, she actually developed somewhat as a character, a rare thing for TNG, especially early on. And come on, she saved Captain Picard's life. What more do you want? I know what more you want. Welcome to the epilogue. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be. But before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Yogi FPV. Thank you, Yogi FPV. H. Johnson. Thank you, H. Johnson. Joan Worthman. Thank you, Joan. Delish 2020, thank you, Delish 2020. Rob Parr, thank you, Rob. Lester Rookfurt, thank you, Lester. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more. Normally, I'd shout out new channel members who joined at the five bucks a month level or higher at this point, but I didn't have any channel members join at that level or higher since the last time I did shout outs. And that's okay. I did get several new members at the 99 cents per month level, which is fantastic and very much appreciated. Every little bit helps. So consider this a collective thank you to all of my recently joined channel members. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice-monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout-out at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. And again, if you want to help out, please go to patreon.com slash steveshives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. 
If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects. The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low ranking Starfleet officers. We are into our fourth season now and our characters have jumped from the TOS era to the TNG era. Our show is a lot of fun to make, and judging by most of the comments we get, it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. If you're not listening, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. I think you'll really dig it. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and another series, or sometimes a movie, that I have never seen before. We're into Season 2 of DS9. We started out watching Firefly on the off weeks from DS9, and now we're watching the Netflix original animated series Hilda. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Now then, as you know, I hold a poll every month open to all my patrons and members to decide an upcoming video topic. I do not attempt to influence the outcomes of these polls, but there are definitely months where I have my favorites. In the most recently concluded poll, I for sure had a favorite, and I am happy to report that my favorite won! And what a thrilling contest it was! The winning topic prevailed by a single vote after four rounds. That topic, the subject of next month's Trek Actually video is Actually, Star Trek has always been horny. A perfect topic for February, eh? The month of Valentine's Day, the month of love, what better time could there be to watch a divorced single guy in his 40s talk about sex and Star Trek? That's next month. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching, and take care, everybody.